<laughs> technical issues sorted. Um, the first thing, of course, is to say thank you ever so much for the opportunity to speak about my work today. Um, and I'm going to be talking about early genetic concepts of purity and wildness in two senses. And I, I really wish I'd seen Jamie's paper first, um, because what I've called ancestral wildness probably maps quite nicely onto the temporal wildness that you were speaking about. Um, and that's the wildness within us that Darwinian evolutionary thought posits in the 19th century. Um, and I'm going to be describing a shift here from the Darwinian conception of that wildness within us to the genetic way of managing it and conceiving of it. And then very briefly in the second part of the paper, I'm going to talk about what Jamie might have called spatial wildness, but which I unthinkingly call geographic wildness, uh, which is the wildness without uh, what we might anachronistically call uh, biodiversity, um, biological resources, um, or geographic variation as well, because often one only needed to go to the next valley in order to find something that was quite different and useful for your breeding program. But geneticists also went off to places like Persia, raided the tombs in Egypt and so on, and brought very much wilder types of varieties back into the country for their breeding programs. So, we heard all about rogue states, rogue sharks, rogue elephants this morning. I'm here to tell you about the much more dangerous and threatening issue of the rogue pea. Yes. <laughs> so, you can see, um, these are some very healthy looking 19th century peas. Um, this is a variety called Telephone that was released in 1878 by a breeder called William Colbert. Um This thing is something not quite like it at all. Um, it's the same species of pea, uh, probably a different variety, but very weird, I think you'll agree. So you look at these very pointy leaves as opposed to the rounded ones here. Look at these malformed tendrils reaching and grasping into space. Um, <laughs> cue the sinister music of, say, <laughs> pea. Um, so any plant or animal could go rogue, um, and this had a variety of meanings. Um, and the kind of shifting de definition of this out of typeness is what I'm going to be looking at in the first part of the paper. So it's hard to think of impurity in any sense without thinking of the anthropologist Mary Douglas. Um, and I think this quote from Purity and Danger sets up the first half of the paper nicely. Uh, it's from her discussion of William James on matter out of place. And she says, if uncleanliness is matter out of place, we must approach it through order. So, first I'm going to go over the Darwinian attempt to order the impurity of the rogues, and then the genetic attempt. So, um, Darwin, as he talked about everything, also talked about rogues. Um, and in, on the origin of species, they have a specific part to play in this comparison between artificial and natural selection. Um, so, Darwin suggests that plant breeders, when they rogue their flower beds, pulling out the deviant plants, uh, part of a process of artificial selection. Um, he turns to the issue more squarely in uh, variation of animals and plants, animals and plants under domestication, and he has this to say, and I quote, with most of our cultivated vegetables, there is some tendency to reversion to what is known to be, or maybe presumed to be, their aboriginal state. And this would be more evident if gardeners did not generally look over their beds of seedlings and pull up the false plants or rogues, as they are called. So, this sort of thinking about rogues, botanical rogues, is representing a, a kind of Aboriginal state, um, and their eradication being a modifying process, um, it finds a few expressions across the 19th century. Um, but the one that I want to pick out is this, um, from perhaps the leading pre-genetic plant breeder of the 19th century, a man called John Percival. Um, this is from his uh, Agricultural Botany, Practical and Theoretical Textbook, a book which went through something like 23 different editions, wildly popular. And uh, he says, fixation is, however, a relative term, for even in cultivated varieties in which the process of destruction has been systematically carried out and which have come true from seed during many generations, false plants or rogues departing considerably from a type appear among the offspring at regular intervals. If this destruction is not carried out, then they will continue to reappear. And this is really the best counsel that a Darwinian plant breeder has. 
you've just got to continue maintaining eradicating the rogues from your seed beds. They're a fact of life. There's very little that one can do about them. Now, opposed to uh, Darwin on many things, uh, William Bateson, uh, oh sorry, I should just say, if one has a, a mind full of this vision of what rogues mean, um, as a plant breeder, one comes to sell one's products in this style based on their lineage. And um, this lineage is about um, recording that successive roguing process as it's gone on through generations. So, what changes? Uh, this is Bateson, the first British geneticist, speaking in New York in 1902. Um, and he says, um, to set this quote up, a breeder or seedsman introduces some strain of new variety of his seed, peas or whatever it may be. He finds a number of rogues which are not true to the character which he desires to put on the market rogues which he is unable to eliminate. Formerly we said it was only a question of time, he must hoe out the rogues and go on, and he will gradually fix his type, but now we begin to see what the facts really mean. <laughs> and on a, a genetic account, this is what the facts of rogues really mean. Uh, rogues are entirely purity of strain, and so uh, an opposite rogues, uh, a function of fixity of character. Um, and fixity of character is due to the union of similar gametes. So this is going to be a little bit complicated. How many geneticists are there in the world? <laughs> <laughs> so close your ears for a second. I'll try and explain this to everyone else. Um, so the, the thing to note first of all is how completely bounded this diagram is. It comes from Reginald Punnett's Mendelism published in 1907. It's the Ur genetic diagram, if you like. Um, and there are only three generations here, uh, because three generations is all the geneticist needs to explain the totality of heredity everywhere in different places. And the genetic supposition is that every organism, or box in this case, uh, contains factors which determine the character of that organism. So there are two factors for any given character, the geneticist says. During gametogenesis, the process of producing pollen and ovum in plants, um, each gamete only contains one factor, so that in fertilization, these character-producing factors can come back again and recombine. No, though, in this cross between purely black factor containing and purely white factor containing uh, individuals, one gets a recombination, one of each type of factor. So the next genetic presupposition is that one of these factors will be dominant over the other. So let's say white is dominant over black. Um, this will have the white characteristic of this parent here. Let's say it's flower making color. When one takes these plants and self fertilizes them, so to imagine another identical box here and they're crossing together. Uh, one creates, again, a series of gametes, which only have one factor in them, and a series of recombinations here. So, on the surface, what's happening here is a white-flowered plant is being crossed with another white-flowered plant, and it has black-flowered offspring. What Bateson is saying is that when you get rogues, you're starting with one of these by mistake. You haven't accounted for your factors. Properly. If you've only ever used these sorts of individuals with the same types of factors, homozygotes in the, in the term of art, uh, then your variety will breed true from the start. So fixity of character, purity of strain is due to the union of similar gametes. Okay, and uh, these are not idle words. So uh, geneticists produced new varieties that were purified, homogenified, um, and homozygotes. And these are two of them. So the first one, uh, Yeoman, was released in 1916. Uh, the second one, uh, Little Joss, in around 1908. And these are both bred by William uh, uh, Roland Biffin, a great friend of uh, William Bateson's, and another of the first British geneticists. Um, so <laughs> these were sold as non-roguing purified varieties. They went out onto the market and they rogued just as much as the varieties before. Uh, wheels fell off the dream. Um, and in fact, rogues have now been statistically confined to acceptable limits of variation. 
If your variety only rose this much, then that's okay. We can call it a stable variety. Uh, that anomaly has been um, defined and uh, all of the venom has been taken out of it by turning it into a statistical infrequency. So to switch to the second part of the paper, thinking about wildness for that. Um, if these are the new purified genetic varieties, which will always supposedly breed true, where did they come from? Well, Roland Biffin is surprisingly coy about where they came from. It's very difficult to track down any clear statement of what breeding materials he used to produce these varieties. So implicated at different points are American varieties called Michigan Bronze, Russian varieties called Gurkha, and British varieties called Burgoyne's Fife. And he kind of changes the story, publication to publication. And um, what he does say about another cross in 1925 is that by the time this has been accomplished, perhaps the League of Nations will be able to turn its attention to deciding what nationality the new wheat is. So this mixing of varieties from different countries is absolutely typical. These are the varieties from different countries. Um, so this is a piece of uh, paper technology, if you like. Uh, it's a museum plot book. Um, so uh, the National Institute of Agricultural Botany, where Biffin worked for many years, uh, kept a, a series of plots in which varieties were maintained um, and used. This wasn't called a seed bank or a seed vault. It was called a museum of varieties. Notice how uh, any given variety only takes up one line. There's no generational information here at all. Um, and there's nothing other than the source of seed. Right? That's not the breeder or the originator of this variety. It's just where they got it from. And most of these actually come from institutional swaps with other institutions uh, or other plant breeders. So um, nestling in amongst these kind of quite usual English varieties, you have uh, Dreadnought, um, White Fife, um, Old Kent Drop. Um, you also have Egyptian Mummy, uh, which I believe was taken from the opening of the tombs in Egypt. Um, the Great Unknown. <laughs> I don't think it really was, but I'll come back to that. Um, and where's it gone now? Uh, Burbanks, which would have come from Luther Burbanks uh, breeding uh, grounds in uh, California. Um, and Einkorn, which is an ancestral variety believed to be something like a wild wheat, mm -hmm. uh, wild wheat ancestor. So, the last column of this table records whether the varieties are still being propagated or not in the notes. Um, and the interesting thing here is that essentially once a geneticist has extracted an interesting factor from the variety, it becomes dead. Um, there's no further use to it, other than to be maintained in case that factor comes back in useful again. Uh, there's no repeated breeding with that variety for extra variation. There's no breaking the type that would have been done in the 19th century just to create variation one could pick amongst. Um, so this is a, a, a system, I would argue, for um, isolating and purifying the varieties in terms of their external constituents in the same way as the genetic theory isolates and purifies the factors within a variety. Um, and I think those two things are somewhat new. So uh, just by way of conclusion, um, this is a sweet pea. What could be wilder than a sweet pea? Um, and this one's a particular type of sweet pea called Evelyn Hemus. Now, Evelyn Hemus was released onto the market in 1908, exactly the same year as Little Joss, Biffin's <laughs> genetic variety. Um, and it was bred by Hilda Hemus. Now, Hilda Hemus was the spurned first love of Biffin, who ended up marrying her younger sister, Mary Hemus. And the variety is named after a third sister, Evelyn Hemus. Um, so, Sweet peas are not genetically insignificant. These were the second genetic model organism after edible peas. And it's with sweet peas that Reginald Punnett worked out much of what we know about linkage at the time. Um, so 
when William Bateson, Roman Biffin, Reginald Punnett, the first geneticists needed experimental breeding stocks, it was precisely to these communities of plant breeders like the Hemus sisters that they turned. And of course, the Hemus sisters roved their varieties. Uh, this was a generational plant breeding family outfit. The parents had also been plant breeders, and the family home had always been used for plant breeding. So, thinking about stewardship and maintenance, which is what roving really is, um, made me think of ghost acres. Um, so this is a concept which has been coined in order to bring attention to all of the uh, acres of resources which were required in foreign and other countries to underwrite the Industrial Revolution and the European development more generally. So, by way of a bold claim to conclude with, I think we can say that the genetic revolution was underwritten by ghost acres and the communities that tended to do them. Thank you very much.